from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I am thrilled to be here to introduce an amazing author, Ellen Hopkins. She's a poet, freelance writer, and the award-winning author of 20 nonfiction titles and five New York Times best-selling novels in verse, including her enormously popular Crank trilogy of young adult books. She tackles gritty topics such as drug addiction, mental illness, and HIV, but she's not afraid of them, and neither are her large audiences. Philadelphia Inquirer stated, rather than turning away teens, her readers race through hundreds of pages. She speaks to young people in a voice they can identify with, and this is fostered by her unique use of verse. She explained this in an interview, verse as storytelling format feels like a character's thoughts. It puts readers right on the page inside my character's head. Her long list of awards would take up the whole time slot, but I just want to highlight a couple. A 2008 American Library Association Best Books for Young Adults Award, a 2009 YALSA Top 10 for Teens, also from the American Library Association, and a Nevada Governor Arts Award, and so many more. She gives back by mentoring other writers as a regional advisor for the Nevada chapter of the Society of Children Book Writers and Illustrators. And she speaks regularly at schools, writers' conference, and book festivals like this very one today. We're so thrilled to have her. Her most recent book is a young adult novel, Tilt. It debuted on September 11th at number three on the New York Times list, yay. Hopkins brings the teen characters from her adult novel triangles into a story that's described as love, good, and bad, forces three teens' world to tilt. The multitude of enthusiastic comments can be found on Hopkins' Facebook page. And this testifies to the dedication of her countless fans, as do you here today. One of them wrote, Hopkins seems to understand every type of teen or adult out there. Please help me give a very warm welcome to Ellen Hopkins. Actually, there's one teen I don't understand, and his name is Orion, and he's my 16-year-old almost at home. I don't understand him very well at all. You guys, I get. So, actually, I'm going to have to update that bio, because Tilt was actually my number nine New York Times bestselling book. So all my teen novels have reached there. How many of you guys have read one or more of my books? That's, that's pretty good. The rest of you have some catching up to do. Um, so Crank, which was my first teen novel, was loosely based, inspired by my, my own daughter's story of meth addiction. And I'm sure most of you guys know that. And how many of you guys, I can see one copy of Crank, so I know at least one of you have read Crank. Um, how many of you guys have read Crank? Yay! Uh, so, Crank is what brought me here. It's not what brought me to writing. What brought me to writing was A, my mother, who loved books and poetry and classic literature and read to me every day and my little brother till I finally said, Mother, <coughs> I can read now. But she instilled in me this love of language and, and the idea at the back. So like I know a lot of teens go, my mom says I can't be a writer because you can't make any money at it. You can still write and you can also make money at it. Just tell them I said so. 
But my mom always said, you can do whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. If you want to be a writer, I will help you do that. I also had excellent teachers. I love teachers. I might have had one I didn't like once, and I think that was my PE teacher, actually. But other than that, I've always loved te I've had great teachers in my life, and in both public school and private school settings teachers who also told me I could do what I wanted, that I should be a writer because they could see something, they could see talent in me as young as nine years old. So all of you people who don't think teachers make a difference, you're wrong. Right on, yeah. Um, I went to college, I, you know, I, I actually published my first poem when I was nine years old. And it was a fabulous haiku that I don't remember, but I know it had to be good because I wrote it. <laughs> and also because it published. And so I did. At nine years old, I saw my name in print for the first time. So there, again, you know, I had this kind of idea in the back of my head. Look, I could be a poet. I could be a writer. I am a writer. I published. You know, that's, so it's, it started there. And I published poetry all the way through high school and into college. Studied journalism in college. And if you have read Crank, you know I met <clears throat> There's an ex-husband in the book who uh, I met in college. I dropped out to get married and have a couple kids and have my own business, which was a, I, I, I had two. I had a catering service and also a video store, just as video was getting big. So that's what I was doing for this big chunk of my life when I wasn't a writer for money, but I always I was writing something. You know, I had drawers of yellow legal pads with poetry and short stories and essays on them and, and I hid them so nobody saw them including my current husband who when we got together we, we, we decided we were going to change courses in our lives right so we got married we were both coming off this bad relationship so we moved to Tahoe to start life anew and so I had sold my business and I'm like hmm now what am I going to do with my life right and I'm like I am a writer. And my husband's like, you're a what? Because he'd never seen those yellow legal pads with all that writing on it. But I chose at that time, I was around 32 years old, I chose at that time to become a writer. I, I didn't want to get a day job. I was going to dedicate myself to it. So I pulled on my journalism background, went into freelance writing, which I did until uh, about six or seven years ago, probably when the books really started to take off. Um, so I was a food and wine writer for a number of years. Pretty good job, if you can get it. Get to eat free at all the really best restaurants at Tahoe. Then you need a gym membership. <laughs> but, um, so I started writing there. And, and, and I would like young people who are considering writing as a career to understand that novels is not the only way you can have a career in writing. You can become a journalist. From there I moved into nonfiction. So I, the 20 nonfiction books I wrote before I did this allowed me to do interesting things, like I got to fly with the Thunderbirds. And I didn't lose my lunch like the reporter in front of me did. Not in front of me, but the one that went ahead of me. <laughs> um, I got to jump with the Golden Knights. I got to meet Robert Ballard, who was the guy that discovered the Titanic and worked with Monterey Bay Research Institute putting ROVs down in the deep water trenches. Um, so really interesting things I got to do as a, as a nonfiction writer. It's another way you can go as a writer. And then always writing poetry and always kind of playing with, I actually thought I was going to be a picture book writer. Um, that's not where I belong <laughs> as a writer. You know, I was like playing with picture books and which is a really unique skill. For, so for those of you who think that, you know, oh, I can just write a picture book because that's really easy. Not so much. Uh, so, but I, I sat down, I, what had happened in my life was, there's a poem in Crank that says, it started with a court-ordered summer visit. So my ex-husband who had left our family in favor of cocaine when Christina in the book Crystal in real life was a baby in diapers, her older brother was two, he had walked out on our family in favor of cocaine moved to Albuquerque to get high and continue to get high until about three years ago when he had a massive heart attack. Yeah, he survived. Um, but he had wanted nothing to do with my kids at all until he decided he was getting remarried. And then he wanted to, he sued me for visit, visitation 
Um, and so on that court-ordered summer visit, I sent my daughter, at the time 16 years old, straight A plus student, 150 IQ. Her dream was computer animation, and that's she was headed for Seattle and the Art Institute of Seattle. That's where she wanted to go to school. She wanted to get out of college and work for Pixar. And instead, she went to see her dad. I mean, all that stuff represented in the book is all those kind of basic plot points are true. Um, met a guy who turned her on to crank crystal meth for the first time when she was back there and her life <sighs> gone. I mean her dreams were over and so she came back she started to the grades went down when school started she started getting in trouble at school we started looking for what had happened to her and we found crystal meth put her in outpatient rehab put her in counseling did all the things that we thought we should do to try to save her but the, the problem with that drug is you need to want to save yourself, and she did not. She had a baby in her, in her senior year who we did crank ends with her listening to that baby cry in, in the house, deciding whether or not to go be his mom or to go back to the drug. She chose the drug over the baby. That's my 15-year-old at home. <laughs> my brilliant, lovely, stinky 15-year-old boy. Um, but so all that stuff really happened. That had to become a book somewhere because it was like six years of addiction that we tried to help her, we tried to fight with her and it didn't work. She ended up going to prison and when that happened, I had to make some sense of those six years of my life. I had to make sense of what happened to my daughter. I had to know, I chose to write first person from her point of view because I wanted to get into her head and try to figure out what happened. And so this is a book that I had to write and I had to write it for you because I want you never ever to make that same decision. And it was just, it was like fate that brought me here. I'm really happy to be here. That's not the way I would have chosen to be here, but here I am. And I know this book has made a difference in a lot of lives. There are two million copies of this book in print around the world. It's in high school, it's required reading in some high schools. It's, it's in drug treatment programs and drug counseling programs. And the book has made a lot of difference. So it brought some kind of meaning to that six years of my life. And it also made me discover a passion for teens and for writing for you and for trying to reach you th by showing you possible choices and possible outcomes to those choices. And if I can show you in a very real way what might happen to you if you make the decision to use math, or you choose suicide, or you don't stand up and talk about the abuse in your life, if I can show you a better way through my books, I will. And that's why I push back very hard against censors. I don't write in fear of censorship. I don't write for reviews, which I don't actually read because, you know, you can have like a thousand good reviews and get one bad one and go, that person didn't like my book. It's weird. <laughs> it's like, okay, I just won't read them. <laughs> but I don't write in fear of censors. I don't write for reviews. I don't write for reward awards. I write for you. Um, and so Tilt, which is my nine book, ninth book, I chose those subjects because I've heard, I hear from you. You know, my Facebook and Twitter and Goodreads and that's a big part of my day, as you can imagine. It's between two and 300 messages and tweets and whatever a day. Um, and so I hear things that are affecting your lives and when I hear them enough, I'm like, okay, I need to write about that. Teen pregnancy, which is one, which is represented in tilt falling in love with somebody with HIV because we've stopped talking about HIV in this country. And so if I don't remind you that it's there, you might forget. That came from a 19-year-old bookseller. He's like, he comes to me, a series of email messages. He's like, I'm Latino and I'm gay and I can't tell my parents. And I'm like, but you have to tell your parents because they're going to find out. So I convinced him to tell his parents. He came back to me and said, yeah, okay. They said, okay, but never bring a disease into the house. 18 months ago, he wrote me to say, I have contracted HIV and I can't tell my parents. So I am now working with him to find a way to tell his parents this. If I can help you avoid that, ever having to tell your parents something like that, I will, because I'm like that. <laughs> so I'm um, very proud of Tilt, which is the teen companion to my adult novel, Triangles. You don't have to read Triangles to read Tilt. 
but I think it's an interesting experience. Uh, you know, Triangles, which was my first adult novel last year, about three women that hit midlife and start deciding, they have to decide whether they're comfortable where they're at or whether they're gonna make some very big changes in their lives. So while they're going through their own kind of problems, their teens are being hit with problems too, right? And so, but they're not noticing. And so the idea, the back and forth kind of like parental POV of triangles and the teen POV in Tilt, I think is a really interesting contrast to read. Um, Tilt is an adult, I mean, triangles is an adult book, so I would remind you that, but I have a lot of teen readers that are reading. I was reading in high school, we did not have good YA when I was in high school, and I was reading very inappropriate books. <laughs> we didn't have any choices, so I'm like, well, who knew life was like that? <laughs> so, and then I'm just gonna read a little bit. This is the book that will be out in November. This is a bound galley of my book called Collateral. Uh, this is a real crossover book because these uh, protagonists are 20 to 25 throughout the length of the story. This is about a couple that meets um, just as he's leaving for his first deployment to Iraq. It's about, uh, they fall in love, and it's about them trying to build a relationship through four deployments. Spent a lot of time with military, mostly wives and girlfriends, but also husbands, families, kids, um, thinking about what it would mean to have this person that you are in love with and trying to build a relationship toward a wedding as they're changing as they come back from each deployment. I want to keep you know, some focus on traumatic brain injury, TBI, PTSD, because um, we have a lot of soldiers coming home very soon. And I want to keep focus on them so we can think about the resources they're going to need. I'm not going to read a lot, just a few, couple poems for you. Um, so Cole, who is a frontline marksman marine, um, is also a poet, because I like contrasts. <laughs> so you get war poetry from Cole. Um, and so this is, and this first poem, by the way, this first poem, which is a poem I wrote a couple years before I wrote this book, is now on a traveling exhibit about war going around the country. So photos of war, um, and this is a, a ghazal, which is a type of formal poetry. You will hear the repetition, the, the refrain in this poem that a ghazal demands. And then we go on to the regular verse. Ugly in black, as earth returns to chaos, her women brace to mourn. Excavate their buried faith, tap reservoirs of grace to mourn. Soldiers steady M16s, search stillborn eyes for welcome or signs of commonality. Ferreting no trace, they mourn. Few are safe, where passions swell like gangrene limbs you cannot amputate. Sever one, another takes its place, and you mourn. Free fall into martyrdom, a bronze-skinned youth slips into the crowd, pulls the pin. He and destiny embrace, together mourn. Grenades are colorblind. A woman falls, spilling ebon hair beside the blonde in camouflage. Death's doorman gives chase, all mourn. Even hell capitulates to sudden downpour. Cloudburst sweeps across the hard pan, cracks its blood-stained carapace. Hear God mourn. Up through scattered moats, a daughter reaches for an album. She climbs into a rocking chair to search for daddy's face and mourn. Downstairs, a widow splinters on the bed, drops her head into his silhouette, etched in linen on the pillowcase to mourn. Alone, the world is ugly in black. When final night descends to blanket memory, drops its shroud of tattered lace, who will mourn? Present. Poets write eloquently about war, creating vivid images of severed limbs, crusting body fluids, and restless final sleep, using nothing more than a few well-crafted words. Easy enough to jab philosophically from the comfort of a warm winter hearth or an air-conditioned summer. But what can a sequestered writer know of frontline realities? Blistering marches under relentless sand-choked skies where you'd better drink your weight in water every day or die from dehydration. Flip side, teeth cracking nights, too frigid for action, bored out of your mind as you try to stay warm in front of a makeshift fire. How can any distant observer know of traversing rock-rutted trails, 
hyper aware that your camouflage comes with a built-in bullseye, or of sleeping with one ear listening for incoming peril, or of the way fear clogs your pores every time you climb inside a Humvee and head out for a drive. You can see these things in movies, but you can't understand the way they gnaw your heart and corrode your mind unless you've been a soldier outside the wire, in country, where no one native is really your friend and anyone might be your enemy. You don't know till you're ducking bullets. The only person you dare rely on is the buddy who looks a lot like you, too young for this, leaking bravado, and wearing the same uniform. Even people who love soldiers, people like me, can only know these things tangentially, and not so much because of what our beloveds tell us as what they'll never be able to. So that's out November 6th. The 2013 Young Adult book is already done and, in, and revised and in production, and that is Smoke, the long-awaited sequel to my second novel, Burn. <laughs> I need to get back to the gym. <laughs> um, and then as a kind of a side project this year, because I don't have enough to do, I'm, <laughs> I'm adapting Crank to the stage. So I'm writing a script for Crank. It'll go to community theater um, at home, and then it'll be available to community or high school theater groups um, across the country. So if you're interested in that, you can get a hold of me. And um, once it's done, I'll... <laughs> looky, looky. Yay, my keeper. <laughs> Thank you. And then, uh, let's see, 2014, yes, there will be a YA book. I just negotiated a contract for 14 and 15 young adult books. What else am I doing? I'm currently contributing to a, an anthology um, that will be out in 2013 called Ripperology. It's 18 YA authors writing Jack the Ripper stories. I'm writing his poetry. <laughs> really weird. <laughs> um, and so I'm doing a lot of short stuff, the, the script, writing books. I'm traveling around 100 days a year doing festivals and high school visits and I don't know what all I'm doing. I don't even know what time zone I'm in most of the time. This is like halfway through this tour, so I think I'm on the East Coast, right? Yeah. Almost, I'm almost here. <laughs> so where are we time-wise? We've got 20 minutes. Okay, I'm going to uh, blab a little more and then I'm going to open it up to questions. Be thinking about questions. You can ask me anything you want because I've answered them all, and if you can stump me, I'll think of something. <laughs> um, yeah, what else am I doing? Oh, well, I'm raising a kid. I told you that. Orion, who I thought would never get off the computers. Any parents out there whose kids are like on the computers all the time? I got him a guitar for Christmas last year, he will, he will seriously play guitar two hours a day in favor of computer games. So I think you just have to keep, keep looking until you find what makes him love something. So I'm like, and I'm like, I'm upstairs, I'm like, where is that music coming from? I'm like, that's my kid playing guitar, whoa, seriously. So, gotta keep, and it's, it was the same for me. It was like, you know, you just, I had to keep going to, you know, once you find that talent, that thing that you love, Go for it, young people. Reach for that thing you love, because if you don't do that, your life's going to be miserable, really, seriously. If there's something in your life that you love right now, go for it. You, might, you can always change your mind. That's what being young is all about. I can almost remember being young, sort of barely. All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and open it up to some questions at this point. Yay, it's got to be a first one always. You sort of set me up for it. So how do you balance telling children to go for what they love, or I suppose adults too, because, I mean, this is personal, but how do you balance telling someone to go for what they love versus obtaining uh, economic stability in your life? And, uh, for instance, not all of us can be YA writers that get on the top booksellers of the New York Times. Here. 
you know what, there are no promises in life, right? There are no economic promises. You can go out and get a master's and you may not still have a job tomorrow. So at some point, if you're miserable doing what you're doing, you're gonna, it's gonna, what's the point? You know, I, I mean, I realize you need to make money, but there, again, you know, you start small, you work your way up toward that dream, you can do it. And there are ways, it, it takes dedication and passion for what you love to do that. And you have to just keep pushing past all the no's. And I would, you know, part of, part of life is rejection. Part of life is getting a no, right? So you push past that. And don't marry the wrong guy. <laughs> or girl, I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I have a question about, like, how do you develop your characters? Like, do they come from your personal experiences and just that? Or do you have, like, oh, wait, that's a brilliant idea. They, I can, like, develop that. Like, do you, like, pick the idea first or have the character first? Uh... I mean, I have a theme for a book, right, first, and then I create characters around that. Sometimes they're inspired by real stories, other times they're just characters, like I'm, I'm gonna start the 14 book at some point, like probably a few weeks. But I've been writing characters and building, building the story around that character, building his friends, family, you know, who would this person be with the theme that I'm choosing? I'm, I'm not ready to cut loose with that yet, because if I do that, I know next year three books all about that are going to pop up. <laughs> I, will, I will, when the time is right and I know what I'm going to do exactly, I will release that. But it's, it's a topic that, that I, don't, I don't see addressed very often and I've never addressed, okay? So I need to build those characters around that topic specifically, right? Because this, this is a person who's feeling this way for very specific reasons. So the character building and the, the pre-write end of that is usually two to three months for me before I sit down and write. And I don't outline, and I don't, I might have a plot point or two that I kind of know need to happen. I might have an ending in mind, which usually changes a little bit through the writing process. Um, and I think a lot of writers write this way, although I just, I did an event a couple days ago with a guy, he's like, I don't know how you do that, because, uh, you know, for me, like for some writers, the process is, if you have all the kind of plot points of the out, you know, kind of an outline of what you know needs to happen in each chapter. It's, it seems to flow better for them that way. For me, it, it's, it stops me because I feel like then I'm trying to push characters into a, an artificial, you know, way of going. And so that never works for me. Thank you. Thanks. Um, did you know that your book's gonna affect that many people like when you started writing them? You can never predict success. Do you know what I mean? So the story has to mean enough to you to want to tell it no matter what. There's no way I could have known that, you know, because there, I, I have friends who published books at the same time as I did whose books just have not done as well as mine. And you, there, you, don't, you can't know that. And you can push as much as you want through social networking too, or you know, which I do a lot of, and marketing and all that. But if a book doesn't speak to, to readers on a certain level, then it's not gonna become successful. So I always tell um, writers to write from here, write that story that you, only you can tell and you have to tell it that way. And don't listen to anybody tell you to tell it a different way or don't write that story because if a story means that much to you, it will speak to a lot of people. I, I truly believe that. What did you feel like when you found out people like were really like interested in what you were writing and how like they felt when they well, were like, your like books? like, people like my books. People are reading my books. Yes, of course. And you know what? Crank did not hit overnight. It was not an overnight success. It took a while because nobody knew who I really was as an author, right? So it took a while to catch on. And actually, the first book that hit fairly quickly was Impulse. And Impulse hit because, so that was my third book. At the time, MySpace was the only social networking platform. Somebody that worked at MySpace had read my first two books and liked them. They featured Impulse. So 200 million people sign on to their MySpace page, and up pops this red book cover with a good book review in the back. Psh, I love MySpace. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Paige. And I've loved all of your books. Um, I was just wondering, you capture adolescent voices so well with so many major um, 
issues with growing up and developing. How much research do you do on those topics or is it more just coming from what you see as adolescent suffering? Do you do a lot of research on the issues you cover? Or? I actually do, and I do a lot of primary research. So, I, and I'm fortunate in that now I have enough readers so that, so like Imperfect last year, I've never done beauty pageants, but I, I had a, a character that, that needed to do pageants, so I threw it out to my readers, and I'm like, so if, if any of you have done beauty pageants, will you let me know? And so I got lots of messages back from also from pageant parents, so you know, so I really had a feel for what the pageant experience was. I do a lot of that kind of research. Uh, you know, I mean, certain kind of facts and stuff are, are easily defined on the on the internet, but I spend a lot of time with with readers and with young people, and listening to them talk to me. They talk to me, and I listen to them. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is more like based in the way you write, like. Um, what made you choose to write your books in poetry as opposed to more like normal, stereotypical prose type? Well, okay, so I've been writing poetry like forever. Never thought about writing a, a novel in verse. Um, Crank, when I started Crank, the, the voice was all wrong. So I started in prose. The voice was like angry. It was my voice and it was not Christina's voice. Uh, I put the book away, I went to a writer's conference, and Sonia Stones, who's another verse novelist, was speaking, took a workshop with Sonia, and then it was like, oh, poetry, fiction, she can do it, I can do it, and so then I tried it, and, you know, with Crank specifically, the way her thought processes were working, you know, because you can, sometimes I use more concrete, you know, kind of that more form poetry, um, which I did more of with Crank, because it worked for like her scattered thought processes. And then I'm like, I love doing this, and readers liked it, you know, and it gave readers comfort to be able to see a big book and then have all this comfortable place to stop and breathe through the, you know, the story and whatever. And then I'm just like, I'm good at this. I think I better just keep on doing it. <laughs> but that's why, I mean, I wrote in prose for years, you know. Um, hi, um, I just opened up Tilt for the first time a few minutes ago, and I saw that the dedication was um, dedicated to families with chronic illness, and um, I come from a family that deals with chronic illness. My mother has multiple sclerosis, and um, I'm just wondering what inspired you to write about chronic illness? Was it, um, was it on something like personal base, or just like it was another like character you wanted to tackle or something? Um, and that, again, this was a reader who came to me, at, so at spinal muscular atrophy, is, the, is the, so it's in triangles and tilt. He came to me, it was, so as a teen boy reader, and he said, you, ha you have to write about this, because this is my, he's like, my life, my life hurts too. And I get that my parents have to devote all their attention to my little brother, um, but I have problems too, and they don't see those because they're so focused on him. And then he goes, and you know, I mean, they really should get divorced, but they can't because what would the neighbors think? So then it just starts, you know, something like that will make me start thinking in my head about, a story that needs to be told that maybe people don't hear, you know? And so I wanted to write Chronic Illness in that way. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I, I opened your book for the first time in a wilderness program where I was recovering from hard drug use. And um, I don't really have a question. I just really want to thank you because for the 12 days that I've been home, I've been sober. And I think that's a lot because I had your book. I had a lot of other books, but I had your book especially, and um, I'm really glad I had that. Thanks. Thank you. I'm glad you found it. Very glad you found it. And hang on to it and open it up when you need it. Do you have a copy at home? Good. Okay. I wanted to ask what your inspiration, your initial inspiration to start writing in the beginning was. Okay, I'm sorry, they were clapping over there and <laughs> talking to the mic better. Um, I wanted to ask what your initial inspiration was, like before when you first started writing entirely. Again, it started with like my mom and just, and reading. So reading was my inspiration to write because I, you know, all these stories and building worlds and building, you know, historical places for, for other people to read, that meant so much to me as a reader, as a young reader, and the idea that I could go somewhere else, I could, you know, I could learn something new, I could relate to somebody that was nobody like me, that's what inspired me to become a writer, because it's like, if somebody could do that for me, I want to do that for somebody else. 
Um, hi, I know that all writers experience writer's block at some point. How do you get over that? It, uh, okay, there are different kinds of writer's blocks, right? Sometimes I'll block on a scene. So if I block on a scene, so like, you know, I'm like, uh, what should happen next? I usually go away from the computer, go do something physical. Because like when your body's working, your brain kicks in, the subconscious part of your brain kicks in. And so I'll go work in the garden or take a walk or walk my dogs or whatever. If it's a longer thing, what I found really works well is to go someplace new to write. There's some research that's been done about brain, you know, how your brain works. If you go someplace new where you've never written before, the creative part of your brain, because you start looking at someplace new, so then your, your brain's working on a different level. So try going outside to write or to Starbucks to write or if you can take a trip, go to Kentucky to write or whatever, you know. Um, a lot of times I have, all my friends are writers. Go figure. Writers understand other writers, you know. It's like, so we, we gather our friends around us and we'll go do writers retreats. Like where I live, Lake Tahoe is not far, so we'll go up there, write at the lake or something. But it works really well. Or get some people around you who are other writers and they will inspire you to keep going. Thank you. Um, why do you gravitate towards writing like the darker side of teen life instead of the more happy things that can happen? Because there's plenty of sappy romance out there. I mean, you know, really. <laughs> I, and, I, you know, I don't look at my books as dark. I look at them as writing about kids who are a part of the teen landscape. So, I, I mean, I, it's more interesting to me to write issue-based stuff and also to try to shed light onto the issues I'm writing about. You know, it's for a long, long time, and this is something to remember, especially young voters going into an election, for a long, long time, women were not encouraged to talk about things. In fact, we were told to shut up, and kids the same way. Sexual abuse happened always, but nobody could talk about it, right? Abuse happened, but nobody talked about it. So when we talk about it, it, it remove some of the stigma about that, but it also encourages other people to talk. You know, because for, for almost so many young people whose lives are touched by issues like that, abuse, who don't talk, you need to step forward sooner rather than later. And hopefully by reading about someone like yourself in that way, you will, I am encouraging those people to step up and talk sooner rather than later. It's really hugely important we talk about it, we, then we reduce statistics, you know, like, like, and you know, the childhood sexual abuse, the statistics are ugly. It's like one in four girls and one in seven boys who will be abused in that fashion before they're 18 years old. By talking about it, we look at possible victims, possible perpetrators, and we drag that ugly subject into the light, and then we make it go away, hopefully. Thank you. I was just wondering how long it takes you to write like one of the poems that's in your books. You know, it really depends. Okay, so my writing process is it's very specific that I, I write because of the way the poems all kind of feed one into each other, right? I have to write very specifically page to page. So sometimes those pages happen fairly easily, fairly quickly. I might spend an hour on a single word getting the word right, or the, the line right, or the poem right. Um, and sometimes that's when I have to go away is when the poems aren't like coming, you know what I mean? But I don't, English teachers should do this, la, 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 la. I don't do drafts. I write one draft. And I do that because I write, because I self-edit um, and revise so heavily page to page as I go. Um, and so my revisions are largely like I, I finish a book and I go through it once for one read through for like glaring errors, send it to my editor, and I figure that's her job is like to, to look for the you know weak places. But my revisions in the last few books have been in the hours, you know, eight hours or whatever. Thank you. Hi. I have a question about your second book, Burn. I, I'm actually a non-Mormon from Utah. I grew up there, and so I found that one particularly fascinating, even though it's not my favorite, Crank's my favorite, but it was just so engrossing, your, per, your portrayal of the culture, and I was just wondering what inspired that one, because it's just so unusual. At Burn, which, I mean, I didn't start it to, that's not where I started it. I started it to write about a girl, I wanted the end of it to be a young woman 
considering a shooting rampage because Columbine was behind us and whatever. So I'm writing this character and, and she starts to look like my, we're not Mormon, but we have, we live in a valley that's got a very heavy Mormon population in Nevada. So she started to look like my daughter's friend who had weapons experience. And so the, the Mormon framework just kind of built around the story. You know what I mean? It was, it was weird. So, and then I have friends who are Mormons and friends who are non-Mormons or ex-Mormons. And then it became interesting to look at that as part of the larger structure of the book. Well, as a non-Mormon from Utah, it was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Most of Utah doesn't feel that way. <laughs> Hi, I'm a uh, school librarian, and Band Book Week is coming up soon. And I'm just wondering, from your perspective as, a, as an author who, whose books may have been challenged over the years, are you finding that as you um, bring things to light, as we talk about more things, the challenges are decreasing or staying the same? No. How, and, and how do you handle that? I think, I mean, it's, it's a place of fear where challenges come from. You know, parents are afraid that if kids read about drugs, they're going to go do them. I, I, I argue back the other way. You know, we've, we've had somebody that, that just mentioned how much that book means to her. So I have, I have a file of letters from, from readers who have told me similar things. When librarians have challenges, I encourage them to, to email me for that file. Almost always when parents see that file of letters, they'll change their minds, not always. Um, I, don't think, I think right now we're a very fearful place in this country, and, but which is, makes it all that more important to keep pushing back. The NCAC, National Coalition Against Scholarship, has actually given me a award in November for, for facing them down. You know, that's what we do. You know, and there are writers, Laurie Anderson and Chris Crutcher and, and Walter Dean Meyer and, and, and myself who, you know, we have to push back because these books are important and it's important they stay on bookshelves. Thank you. Hi, um, my question is about when you first started writing and only writing, what your structure was like, how you learned to discipline yourself? It's, um, discipline's a big part of it and I was not as good at it. You know, when you, when you're, when you ha are getting paid to write a book, it's a lot easier to be disciplined or when you have deadlines, you know, and, and when I was a freelance journalist, I had deadlines, so I learned to meet deadlines. And then it becomes, you just have to love what you're doing so much that you want to be in front of that computer, you know what I mean? And so my, my thing is balance, you know, trying to remember to find time for my family and my friends and, you know, to, to pull away from the computer because I'm so into, like my poor husband, he's like, could you have coffee with me this morning, please? <laughs> that's, that's a real challenge, though, is that kind of balance thing, you know? Do you set, like certain goals for yourself though, like writing 3,000 words a day or anything like that? Not very often, unless I'm coming up against a deadline. If I could write 3,000 words a day, I'd be very happy. And again, that's because, I mean, for me, 2,000 words a day is a lot because I'm so, such a specific writer because of my, you know, thing. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for like one more, so yay, you get to be the one more. Yay. Um, I was wondering, as a person who wants to be in your plays, um, how do you get yourself to expand upon the words you're saying? Because for me, it's, I summarize within the sentence. So I was just wondering, how do you expand upon it? How do you become more descriptive of it? I, I you know what, I think it's practice. You know, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> I'm a lot better at it than I was when I started. Um, and again, I think if you can keep people around you that can encourage you and help you find that kind of place that you need to go through it, that's helpful too. So if you can like become part of a, a writer's group or a critique group or something like that, just be very careful that you respect the people in the critique group. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. We have approached over time, so <laughs> thank you guys for coming. I will be signing at 2.30? 2.30. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.